Good morning, Grace Mary Fellowship. How are we doing? You doing okay? Uh, I am uh, in another life. I would have been a prop comic. So today you're going to be seeing me having some props up here. Uh, I don't think I could pull off um, the buff nature of uh, Carrot Top, but uh, it just seems extraordinarily extra, like, buff, right? Anyone? Is that just weird? Is that just me? Okay, that's a weird way to begin, isn't it? Hi, my name is Troy Dean. I'm the campus pastor at Bushnell University, and uh, we've been walking through this book called the Book of Acts. And in the Book of Acts, we have been in the last two chapters the last two weeks. Acts chapter 27, which was last week, which is all about a shipwreck, and then Acts chapter 28, which is kind of what happened after the shipwreck. And the Apostle Paul, who the story we're primarily uh, talking about right now, is on his way to Rome to testify, basically, about his own behavior and his life following Jesus. Now, with this being said, last week we talked a little bit about the shipwreck, and we talked about the fact that shipwrecks, kind of figuratively, kind of like in our own life, they're coming, right? There are different times in our life. You don't sign up for a shipwreck, but shipwrecks kind of find you. And we watched Paul navigate the complexity and the tragedy and the suffering and the challenges of that shipwreck with amazing faith in Jesus Christ. And the, the main point of that entire uh, chapter was really about the fact that resilient faith is built before the shipwreck. Can I get an amen? Right? Because the, the fact is that when you get into the shipwreck, it will reveal cracks. It will reveal places of need. It will reveal the kind of ways in which we are not prepared for the shipwreck. And that's all there. But if you are following Jesus as a regular routine of your life, then when the shipwrecks come, there's a different way in which you experience them and can go through them. The strength of God in the midst of that. And so what we're going to look at today, you know, and, I, and I joked a little bit about our friend Pastor Steve, because Pastor Steve and his wife Mary are on vacation, and it was ironic, I don't know, you know, kind of thing, that, that he's on a boat and we were talking about shipwrecks. And I thought that was interesting. He's obviously not superstitious. That's good. But this week is interesting because we're actually kind of talking about what happens after the shipwreck. And after the shipwreck, all those on the boat swim and make their way to an island. And I'm assuming that they're circling a certain number of islands on this boat that they're on. And I was wondering, like, what would it look like to be shipwrecked on an island? And we always think of, like, like being on a deserted island. Now, the island that Paul and those on this boat get to, it's actually the island of Malta, which we know where that is. And it's not deserted. There's lots of people there, and it's an interesting part of the story. But I always thought, would it be interesting to be, you know, on a deserted island? Anyone seen the movie Castaway, right? Tom Hanks? And I thought, you know, if I was on a deserted island, I probably would need some companionship. And I think at the end of the day that if I were to need to talk to an imaginary person, and I would name this person Steve. <laughs> I think that's what I would do. And then I would be able to, you know, give love to my friend, Pastor Steve, and I would ask the, the volleyball for advice, and I think I would get some pretty good advice if you know Steve at all. Now, this story in the book of Acts, in the Acts chapter 28, it's the last chapter of the book of Acts. And you think like the ending of a long saga like this with all these amazing stories of what God through the Holy Spirit is doing in these different leaders and different people in different communities, that it would have like some really cool kind of crescendo, like dun da 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 and we're like, wow, that was the great ending to a story. We're not going to get that. It's actually going to feel fairly pedestrian. And last week, as I kind of walked through Acts chapter 27, I just kind of had some fun kind of walking through it in kind of a narrative form. And people told me that they liked that. So I thought, okay, I'll do that again with Acts chapter 28. And you have four phrases, basically, that are the outline for the book of Acts chapter 28. And here's the I'm going to have you repeat them after me. The first one is snake. Everybody say snake. snake. Okay, the next one is thank. Everybody say thank. Next one is debate. Everybody say debate. And then the last one is kingdom sake. So it's snake, think, debate, kingdom sake. Okay? Say that five times fast. So let's see how it goes. Acts chapter 28. Once safely ashore, we, now the writer is, uh, his name is Luke. Luke has written both the gospel of Luke and also the book of Acts. So he has like a twofer going on in the New Testament. And so he says we, because he's actually a part of this party at this time. We found out that the island was called Malta. The islanders showed us unusual kindness. 
They built a fire and welcomed us because it was raining and cold. Well, and they just got out of the ocean, like they're cold, right? Paul gathered a pile of brushwood, and as he put it on the fire, a viper, a snake, driven out by the heat, fastened itself on his hand. This is a turn of phrase. He just, he's got a snake now hanging from his hand. Well, when the islanders saw the snake handing, uh, hanging from his hand, they said to each other, this man must be a murderer, for he escaped from the sea, but the goddess of justice will not allow him to live. So in that particular space, their religion taught them that if something bad happens to someone, there's something wrong with the person. There's lots of religions around the world that teach that to this day. And that, that, there, that was going to be their observation of Paul, that he obviously must be a bad person because a snake bit him. Uh, let's try, let's follow along here. But Paul shook the snake off into the fire and suffered no ill effects. The people expected him to swell up and suddenly fall over dead. But after nothing happened, seeing nothing unusual about him, they changed their minds and thought that he was a god. Now that's a pretty quick change of identity for the day, right? Murderer, god to be worshipped, right? <laughs> I don't know, it seems fairly a little bit like uh, swinging the pendulum a little too much, right? Like I think we probably do that in this world to this day also. Oh, they're bad. Oh, they're great. You know, kind of moment. So there's your snake, right? Next part is stink. There was an estate nearby that belonged to a uh, chief, of, chief official, and he welcomed us into his home and showered us with generous hospitality for three days. The father was, his father was sick in bed, suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went in to see him after prayer, placed his hands on him, and healed him. So he heals this official's dad. When this had happened, the rest of the sick on the island came and were cured. It just seems like so the most like, by the way, uh, he walks in, prays for this guy, he's healed. The entire island comes, everybody's healed. And he just moves on. Now, I think the reason why that seems so just like matter of fact is that like we've been walking along with Luke's writing this entire time, haven't we? Like we've seen what the Holy Spirit does through his people. This is just a normal part of what happens when people follow Jesus and they care for other people and they actually come to their aid. And so it makes sense. Well, they honored him in many ways and there was very a, a really cool, amazing moment there. Um, they first them with supplies to get on their boat. They get on a new boat that had wintered on the island in an Alexandrian ship. I have to do some research at some point why they keep mentioning Alexandrian ships. Uh, I saw some pictures. They look cool. Interesting. Uh, Castor and Pollux, they were both the two twin gods that they had on the front of the boat. And they put in at Syracuse. There's a lot of orange people there in Syracuse. Sorry, that's my humor. Uh, no, the Syracuse orange men were not because of that island. They're the university in the east. Uh, they were there for three days. From there, we set sail and arrived, and then they named a number of different places that are basically on the way to Rome, because this is where Paul's going. And as he goes toward Rome, he stops in a couple of different places. He gets to Rome, and while he was there, all these people came to visit him. They had heard about him. There were brothers and sisters who have Jewish faith that heard Paul was there, and they came to encourage him. Three days later, he called them together and all the local Jewish leaders. When they had assembled, Paul said to them, my brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or against the customs of our ancestors, I was arrested in Jerusalem and handed over to the Romans. They examined me and wanted to release me because I was not guilty of any crime deserving death. The Jews objected. So I was compelled to make my appeal to Caesar. That's why he's making his way to Rome. He kept going up the appeal system. I certainly did not intend to bring any charge against my own people. For this reason, I have asked to see you and talk to you about this. It's because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. They replied, we have not received any letters from Judea concerning you. None of our people who have come from there to hear have reported and said anything bad about you. But we want to hear about what your views are about for we know that people everywhere are talking about this sect, this group of people who are following Jesus and think that Jesus is the Messiah. And then Paul continues to teach. And each day, more and more larger numbers came to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God from the law of Moses, from the prophets. And he tried to persuade them about Jesus. So the second word is thank. Paul is actually very thankful that these folks come to hear him. 
It's encouraging to him that there are those who know who God, Yahweh, is, and they're coming to, to encourage him, and that they also have not heard anything bad about him. But as he begins to teach about who Jesus is, it changes a little bit of the atmosphere. Matter of fact, those of the Jewish background, the Jewish faith, they don't necessarily believe what he's telling them about Jesus of Nazareth, that he was the Messiah. They disagreed among themselves and began to leave. And after Paul made this final statement, so there's your debate, right? Here's how Paul answers and ends kind of the conversation with them, the debate. The Holy Spirit spoke the truth to your ancestors when he said through the prophet Isaiah, go to this people and say, you will ever be hearing, but never understanding. You will ever be seeing, but never perceiving. For this people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears. They have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. Therefore, I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles, and they will listen. Everybody say, ouch. Right? Paul is just as frustrated, so frustrated with their unwillingness to receive from him the, the story of who Jesus is, what he did, and what is true about him, that he quotes Isaiah. But more so, he's quoting Jesus. Because Jesus says the same thing in Luke 4 and in Matthew 13. He says, there are those who are going to genuinely listen and understand. And they'll turn back to God and he will heal them. But for the others, if it's a dead end road, if that's what's happening, then we're going to go to the Gentiles. And that's where Paul has been sent, right? He's of Jewish faith and, and upbringing, but he goes to the Gentiles, those of non-Jewish uh, upbringing, and he says, that's who I'm going to go to. So he ends the debate with basically saying, if you don't want to listen, fine, I know where I've been sent. And he quotes the same passage from Isaiah, who was frustrated with the hearers at his time, and Jesus, as he was frustrated with those hearers. And so the very last part of Acts chapter 28 says this. This is the crescendo of the book of Acts. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house and welcomed all who came to see him. He proclaimed the kingdom of God and taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Interesting, without hindrance. He's arrested and he's in chains, right? I love the fact that he taught with boldness and no hindrance. You know what that means? It doesn't matter your circumstances. Good, bad, ugly, whatever it is, you could still speak about Jesus with boldness and conviction. Can I get an amen? As a matter of fact, at times, in those situations, it's probably even more powerful, isn't it? You should be sad. You should be upset. Snake, think, debate, for kingdom's sake. That's the book of, the, the last chapter of the book of Acts. Now, if I have my map. I can throw my map up there. And you can kind of see on the map that we're way over the far left-hand side of the map now, right? So there's Malta. It's my little arrow I put there. And then they kind of go up the road uh, along the way. And it's interesting to me because I'm kind of a little bit of a historian. Uh, I am by career choice, by calling of God, a church planter. I helped plant two churches in California, made our way up here. I actually started looking around for church plants as soon as I landed in Eugene. I'm like, okay, where are my crazy bohemian, you know, Pacific Northwest church planters doing like new things, different things, crazy things in the name of Jesus. And I looked around and I was like, I was like, why? It just doesn't seem like they were that edgy. As a matter of fact, I found different churches, and it was interesting. I actually like the names of churches. I think churches' names are very interesting. And I went up to Portland, and I found a church that was called Colossae. Colossae is the city of where the Colossians lived. And I thought, okay, that's an interesting name to choose. And it's a good church. I love the pastors that were there. It was really neat. And then my friend, A.J. Svoboda, that I met when I first moved here, didn't know him very well yet, but I chased him up to Portland. And I'm like, I hear good things. I hear you're doing really cool things. What's the name of your church? And he said, Theophilus. And I, ooh, that's who Luke's writing to, right? The most excellent Theophilus, which is really where they got the quote from the movie Bill and Ted's from. But it's like, there's this situation where they're choosing the name of this person who they're making their case to, which is what the book of Acts is all about. They're making a case that these folks who follow Jesus Christ are actually doing good things. They're not trying to topple the government, though they believe Jesus is king, that he is Caesar, he is Lord, right? 
Well, there's another interesting possible name. Um, if we're going to use historic names for places and things, I thought, man, if I were to help plant a church in Eugene, maybe I should plant it with a name. Let's see here, left at the top, highlighted. Three Taverns. I think that's a great name for a church. Three Taverns. It'd be interesting to see the people who would show up on a Sunday morning, <laughs> going to Three Taverns and see what they would get. Sorry, that's a long way for a silly joke. Okay. Acts chapter 28 for two whole years. It seems kind of anticlimactic. Matter of fact, the end of this book seems kind of like you're waiting for a cutscene, right? Marvel movies, anyone, right? You're like, we're waiting, like, what's going to actually happen? What's next? Like, they're gonna be, they are going to got to tell us something that's going to happen next. What's, what's going on? And I think the book of Acts actually does do this. But we're going to have to back up and spend a little bit of time in what I'm going to call a montage. A montage of the book of Acts. Because I think what's going to happen oftentimes, and it happens to us all the time, is we get distracted by the details sometimes and we miss the big picture. See, the book of Acts tells all these stories of people following Jesus, how the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and they do miracle things. They call people back to God. And there's just an amazing amount of activity that happens in the book of Acts. But the book of Acts is kind of like probably not titled correctly because it's not really about the book of Acts. Some um, versions of Scripture, some Bibles actually named the book the Acts of the Apostles. I want to make a case today that I think that's not even adequate. And the way that I came to this is I was trying to figure out, like, what's the big idea for today? Out of Acts chapter 28, what's the big idea? So I, I, I tried with someone. The first one was this. Don't miss the mission of Jesus for the Bible verses. I thought that was kind of, ooh, ooh, kind of edgy kind of thing, right? Like we can miss the forest for the trees, right? Like the whole point of what is going on in the book of Acts is what we need. The next one, I was like, okay, I don't, I, I'm not going to use that one. I mean, what could be another big idea? So I said, we are living in the chapters of the Acts of the Holy Spirit. That's what we should title the book, right? It's the Acts of the Holy Spirit because at the end of the book, yeah, Paul's still doing what he's doing. There's other disciples doing what they're doing. There's churches that are all over the place because of he's planting churches. But it's really about the Acts of the Holy Spirit. That actually continues on. Ah, oh, no, nah, maybe that doesn't really ring a bell. I don't know if you guys are going to remember that tomorrow morning. So I thought, okay, so here's, I thought, okay, this could be a good one. How about you and I are Acts 29? Ooh. Right? Like, that's how the book continues on. Like, we're the next chapter. Everybody say amen. Right? But I'm like, I don't know, maybe that doesn't really work out. But he, this is why I got to it, right? In John chapter 15, Jesus is speaking to his disciples, and he says this, When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me, and you must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. Jesus is saying to his disciples, hey, here's the deal. You are not going to be able to do this by yourself. You need a power. I'm not going to be here. I'm going up. That's on the direction where heaven is always for us. But like I'm ascending and I'm going to be there on the right hand of the Father and I'm sending you a helper, the Holy Spirit, the advocate. The one who will convict the world of sin, but will give you power to live each and every day. In Acts chapter 1, right? We talked about this. In my former book, Theophilus, this is where Luke is writing, I wrote about all that Jesus began began to do and to teach until the day he was taken up to heaven. After giving instructions through the Holy Spirit, the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them, gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days, spoke about the kingdom of God, On one occasion, he was eating with them. He gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Jesus is doing a preview here, right? Like I'm not leaving you alone. I'm giving you a power to live this life. Continuing in that same passage. Then they gathered around him and asked, Lord, at this time, are you going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the days or the time, the times or the dates the Father has set by his own authority. So they're asking, is now when we take back the government? Is now when like it now becomes like a, a God-centered government and rule? Now do we kick out the Romans? Is, that, this, is, this, is this now when we do this? They still didn't understand that the kingdom of God came in a totally different form and, fa- and way. 
that Jesus was not a military leader, that he was a suffering servant. And that his death on the cross was the contrarian way to get actually to salvation for everybody in the world. He says, no, that's not the way. Here's what he says. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, in your hometown, in that region, to people who you don't like and everybody else around the world. And he said this, and he was taking it before their eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. I don't know if you grew up playing a game the, the way I played it, but there was a game called Tag. Now, I, I say that, and I know that there's lots of different versions of Tag out there. Matter of fact, I watch ESPN 13. Anyone watch ESPN 13? Like, it's like, yeah, there's that many channels now with ESPN, and they actually have professional Tag. Have you seen this? And that's how boring my life is that I watch ESPN 13. Uh, and so there's like grown people chasing each other in what I can only describe as an adult like jungle gym. It's got bars and things to climb over and run around and the whole thing, and they're playing tag. Now, the version that we played in my front yard and on the street that I grew up on, like you would decide who was going to be it, the tagger or the person who was it, right? And then everyone would run, and if you tag someone, you said, you're you're it, right? Tag, you're it kind of thing. And then they would move on. And then at my house, in front of our house, there was a big ash tree and that was safe, right? So and you run, you're, I'm safe. And then you'd run again until someone tried to catch you, right? And the way that we decided who was going to be the initial tagger or the initial person who was it, there was a ritual we would go through. We would say, one, two, three. Ah, you may have played as well. Not it, right? And then the last person to say not it, the slowest person who who didn't catch on, didn't catch when they were saying that, then that person was it, and they would go around and they would start the game of tag. It seems interesting to me, and this is the way my brain works, but in the book of Acts, Jesus ascends, they're all staring at the sky, and there's an angel there that says, "Uh, what you looking at? And I, I want to say, like the whole, in, in you know, the way that the, the the word comes across, it seems like he's saying, "What are you staring at the sky for? Get busy." Now, I don't necessarily mean busy in a weird way. I think it's just in a way of like, "Hey, tag, you're it." And that's what the Book of Acts is all about. At the end of the book, the ending of the book is, "Tag, you're it." The Holy Spirit is available to each one of us to live the life that we've seen modeled and expressed and experienced by those through the book of Acts. Can I get an amen? Now, that should, in some ways, kind of scare us a little bit, right? I mean, that seems a little bit challenging to live that kind of a life. And I don't know about you, but I think that as I've watched the church, big church, throughout all the centuries, It seems like many of us, when the opportunity came, the Holy Spirit says, you're it, tag, you're it. We all responded, one, two, three, not it. Everybody say, ouch. That's not the answer, right? No, we're supposed to be it. He left us here to do the work, to continue it on. My joke is when I talk with students and we've had the joy of getting students baptized over in the Willamette River. And we've, yes, we've done it in February. Uh, <laughs> serious baptisms going on in February in the Willamette River. And I said, the reason why we know that God has given us the Holy Spirit, that we're supposed to continue the work, right? Is because he leaves us here. If not, we would get wet and then we would get wings. But that's not the way it works. Jesus, when he gets baptized, it's not because he needed to repent from sins. It's because he's being launched into ministry. And for each one of us, that moment of baptism, Holy Spirit in our life, is supposed to remind us that now we're it. We continue the work. And so I landed on the big idea. My big idea is that by enabling the enabling power of the Holy Spirit, you're it. Or a more simple way, we are empowered by the Spirit to continue the mission of Jesus. And I think that's what we're supposed to be about. So here's some highlights. We, we talked a little bit about the beginning of the book of Acts in Acts chapter 1. In verse 8, he says this. This is the, 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 um, the writing of the, the Luke himself is writing this, but he's saying it 
from the words of Jesus. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. And I want to tell you, I, I, I give props to this place. I, mean, I love this community of faith because I think we take that seriously. The team just was in Uganda. The team right now finishing up in Alaska. You know, we've worked in Myanmar. We have church planters in rural areas of even in America. Uh, locally, we're involved with like helping kiddos out and families in the HIV Alliance. And I love the fact we take this seriously, both locally and globally. Matter of fact, it's really fun to be around here during Christmas, isn't it? Like the generosity that you all bring to the table is just profound. It's amazing to me. All the different ways in which you give and, and help and support different organizations and ministries in our town. But it continues on, and it's really interesting to me because in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit empowers the disciples to be and speak about Jesus in this public space. And it says like tongues of fire land on them and they speak. And when they speak, everybody there who is from so many different countries, so many different language groups, so many different uh, backgrounds, they all hear the words in their own native tongue. And it's a powerful story. And it reminds me that when Jesus walked into the temple, in his last week of life. And he saw all the things that were going on in the temple. And he made it an observation. He said, wow, you guys have completely missed the point. And I would say that I think at that time they were missing the forest for the trees. Missing the mission of God for the sake of religion. And they were using all kinds of economic things to like, you know, oppress people. And they were using different ways to, for them to basically use their own power and influence to take advantage of people who were less than, who had traveled a long way to be there. And Jesus says this, he says, you have taken what has been intended to be a house of prayer for all nations and made it a den of robbers. You see the mission? Do you hear it? It's echoed again in Acts, the ends of the earth, all peoples. And so I think we can get better at this. I think we can continue to get deeper. Because ultimately, in the great, great big story of the Bible, what's happening in Pentecost is a great reversal of the Tower of Babel. If you remember that story, the people are trying to build a huge tower to get to God. They think that they have the power. They're good enough. They don't need to be you know, subject to God. They can be God themselves, and they'll build this huge tower. And the, and the result of that is God scatters the people different language groups, different places all over the world. And what the Holy Spirit is doing in Pentecost is reversing Babel. Now, all peoples from all places, all different language groups are going to come together under Christ. Isn't that awesome? So we are actually supposed to, in working in the Holy Spirit, is be unifiers. Pull people together in Jesus. That's the call in Pentecost. We continue on. In Acts chapter 10, Peter sees this vision. And there's this sheet that comes down from heaven. And all these different kind of animals come down. It, and he would recognize them as animals that are unclean. He should have nothing to do with them. He shouldn't eat them. He shouldn't kill them or do anything with them at all. And it's interesting because later in that same passage, you find out that Peter is staying at the house of Simon the Tanner, who takes animals, hides and tans them and would himself be an unclean person and probably an unclean space. Peter be consistent, right? And so God has to speak to Peter. He introduces him to this guy named Cornelius and Peter's response after seeing all this vision and seeing what God is doing in the life of this man named Cornelius. He says, now I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. It's the same story going on in the book of Acts. All peoples brought back to Christ. Another story in Acts chapter 17. This is Paul now. Paul is coming before this very, like a marketplace of ideas. There are all these philosophers in the room and they have all these different ideas about different things. And they like to debate and talk about them. And they, it's almost like, I don't know, like Twitter or something like that. I don't know. But this is what they're doing. 
And in this particular place, there's all these different like idols and different statues to different gods. And they're trying to cover their base so they, and they don't want to offend anybody. So they have one idol that's to an unknown God. So just in case you got one we didn't name, we got you covered. Paul sees the opportunity and goes, oh, hey, I know that one. I, I, I know who that is. I know who the unknown God is. And in telling about Jesus Christ, he sources from their own culture, poets, I don't know, music lyrics, movie quotes, to tell them that who they're talking about in their own language is actually the God that they're actually hungering for and looking for their entire life. And he says, here's the deal. He's closer than you think. He's been chasing after you. Paul, again, drawing people back to Jesus in super creative ways. And I think we can all do that. Last story in the montage. It's in Acts chapter 26. It's just a couple weeks ago. Pastor Steve was talking about this, and he talked about how Paul was standing before King Agrippa, and he was making a, a, a passionate plea for what his call was to, in this world, was to tell people about Jesus. And Paul tells his own story. He says he was on the way to Damascus with commission to like take care of this sect, these people who were following Jesus, but you know, were supposedly you know, off the rails about what it meant to be a Jewish person. And he says, I was met there. Blinding light knocks him off his horse. He hears a voice, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It's the voice of Jesus. He responds to it and takes up the call to now go and tell other people about this amazing, amazing Savior. So I want to end today with two practical things for you. Is that okay? Like two things you can walk away and I think you can immediately apply in your own life. The first one is to share your simple story. Share your simple story. Now, Paul seems quite extreme, right? That he's blinded by this light and here's the voice of Jesus. But in all ways, in some ways in our own life, we've experienced something simpler like that too as well. When we teach our students uh, how to share their faith, uh, I, I sit them down and I say, so here's the different ways to do this, but I think this is the simplest way. Three word testimony. Just three words. Three words. How, where were you at when Jesus needed to meet you? What was going on in your life? Difficulty, challenges, what was going on? How did he meet you in that place? And then what does that mean going forward? So for me, my three word testimony, rejected, accepted, called. I had a very traumatic experience around rejection growing up. But when I heard the gospel and I heard about how Jesus was, came to this place to accept people and I heard this phrase that I could do nothing to make him love me less or I can do nothing to make him love me more, right? I, to this day, I don't know how to figure that one out. It's called grace. And so I knew I was accepted by what Jesus had done for me. And I feel called now to continue to tell people that same story, that in Christ, you're accepted by God. That's my testimony. We all have a testimony that can be that simple. What are your three words? I'd love for you to think about that today, this week. What three words would characterize where you were when you needed Jesus and hadn't met him yet or maybe in a difficult time of your own faith? How did he meet you in that place? And what does that mean going forward? Last one is an illustration. And now the props. Dun, 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 dun. Ephesians 5, 18, we talked about this a little bit last week. We talked about how Paul talks so much about the Holy Spirit. And he says, keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Follow the Holy Spirit. And he says in, Acts, uh, sorry, in, in uh, Ephesians 5, 18, he says this. Don't be drunk with wine, for that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I tease my friends about this a lot, because I get a chance to teach in lots of different churches. And so from uh, you know, churches that are really, really excited about the Holy Spirit, and churches that are like, yeah, we don't talk about it much, right? And I tease my students. I said, you can tell a lot about a church. And you walk in, figure out which of the three they like best. The Father, the Son, or the Holy Spirit. There's your denominational <laughs> schedule right there, people. I like to tell people, like, hey, here's the deal. I like all of them. I actually talk about all of them. Matter of fact, in every message that I preach, I make sure that I mention all three. Now, I will not divulge to you the mystery of the Trinity today. I do not have the capacity to do that. I will tell you it's a mystery. That's why it's called faith. 
But we believe that. And the Holy Spirit is the one that, that Paul is saying, hey, you got to get in line with the Holy Spirit. you got to be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's no way you can do this by yourself. So you need to be filled. And in the original language there, the word filled there, it has this idea of being empowered or directed or influenced, right? Why does he use wine as an example? And so when I think of being filled and empowered and directed, I think of milk. But not just any old milk. I'm going to reveal something to you right now that will tell you a lot about the Dean family household. That is not a trial size, people. That is the Costco gift of, that keeps on giving. So what does it mean? Why, so why use this? So here's an example, okay? So upon your baptism, upon your decision to follow Jesus Christ, you are gifted the Holy Spirit. Nobody said when. <laughs> Keep it going, right? Keep it filling it up. And so that's the deposit. That's the gift. So in this particular illustration... You are the milk, and the Holy Spirit is the chocolate milk, the chocolate syrup. Now, here's the deal. You can live your life just like this. you got the Holy Spirit inside of you. He's there. He's a gift. You have him there. But we're like, yeah, is that the milk you want to drink? I mean, maybe you can take a spoon from the bottom and just eat the syrup, right? Let's be honest. I, I've never done that before. Uh, but that's not what we're talking about, is it? We all know where this is going, right? To be filled, to be empowered and equipped and enabled and directed and influenced is to be that kind of follower of Jesus. And so my daily prayer, believe it or not, is this. Stir it up. I ain't got it. I'm going to run out by like whatever the first five minutes is I get out of bed. I will not have the capacity to be the kind of person that can witness in this world, that can come of an overflow of my life, the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Like, I will not have it. But what I need is to be directed, empowered by the Holy Spirit. Can I get an amen? So I hope that that's what you would do out of this, even this message today, that you begin to build into your life. Paul says, be empowered, be filled with the Holy Spirit. He is a deposit in your life. The question is, is he just resident or is he actually going to be president? Like, will you live wholly desperate in the power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Will you access the power, the only power that can actually help you live this life in Jesus Christ? To be a person who out of boldness and with no hindrance speak about Jesus. Grace Community Fellowship, tag your it. Holy Spirit deposit in your life. Will you live that way? I have two last quotes because this is the way my brain works. Author John Ortberg says it this way. He says, the Spirit wants to make you a dangerous person. The Spirit wants to make you threatening to all the forces of injustice and apathy and complacency that keep our world from flourishing. The Spirit wants to make you a dangerously non-compliant, make you dangerously non-compliant in a broken world. And then Greg Lavoie says it this way, which I love because it's just so, it's so outlandish of what he says. He says, Jesus only promised three things to those who had followed him, right? That they would be absurdly happy, entirely fearless, and always in trouble. I love that. My benediction to you, Grace Community Fellowship, maybe a commissioning even today by the Holy Spirit, right? That you would be absurdly happy. That means joy. A joy that does not come from yourself. It comes from God. That you would be entirely fearless. You could look at the things offered by the world, the things that bring us trouble and calamity, and say, not today. And that you would realize that following Jesus is going to bring you into, in the world system, a fair amount of trouble. That's what it means to walk with Jesus. It's not an easy thing but I know that he, God's calling us into it. I always say this, but anytime I preach on any passage of Scripture anywhere, I'm always going to end with something from Jesus, right? Jesus, with his disciples, 
It's one of the last scenes that he has with them. He's in this upper room. He walks into a room and he says, hey, peace be with you. He knows they're in turmoil. He knows they're scared. They're probably the opposite of everything we just named, right, in the benediction. And he says this, the Father has sent me. As he has sent me, I'm sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the time in this passage of Scripture today that reminds us that you are up to something bigger than just what we see each and every day in the details of our lives and the distractions that can so easily call us away. That God, you've given us a mission by your Holy Spirit. That God, you've given us the power through your Holy Spirit to be witnesses, to be those who bring the good news to bear in every situation, to be those who model Jesus, his love, his compassion, his truth. God, today, may we receive from all these words the simple benediction of being tagged by you with your Holy Spirit, that we will be your people for all nations, for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen.